I wish I were worthy of all that Daniel has said. We're, of course, extremely proud of him. I think Josh has had a tremendous impact on his life. He's got him and carried him to visit in the community. And so he, I attribute him becoming a preacher more to Josh than uh, anyone. Of course, he's been raised by good parents and he's had a good background there. Uh, I was so proud last Sunday to watch him graduate from the Memphis School of Preaching and then talking to the preaching uh, teachers rather up there and the students, uh, they all uh, seem to really enjoy him being there and knowing him and the work that he's done. I could go on with a lot of things, but uh, we, we're just extremely proud of him and what he's done and what this congregation here has meant to him and to Caleb and to Tim and Donna as well. By the way, do you have a copy of this? If you don't, uh, we'll see that you get a copy. Raise your hand if you don't have a copy. Uh, we have two or three there if you'll help me with that. I've been working on this thing for a while and I hurriedly put it together in a printed form uh, yesterday and I had Sammy to take it over to Donna to print it for me and uh, she designed the front of it and uh, just assumed that I had proofread it enough that everything was all right and so she printed it and when I was going back over it after getting it I found a few typographical errors I found a spelling error and then I found just a gross error and all of that falls on me <clears throat> and I'll try to point these out to you as I go I'll have to wear glasses to be able to see it I can see you all right but I can't see this without glasses I'm so glad for this vacation Bible school. I'm thankful for this church. I got my wife here, and I didn't know she was going to stay 57 years when I asked her to become my wife, but it's a good thing she did. I'd have probably been dead or in the Jimmy Hale mission, one of the two back in Birmingham. So she's been a real treat and a jewel, and uh, she's not made many mistakes, but She's made her share of them, and uh, I've made as many as she has, and then some, but uh, she's stayed with me all these years with all my uh, nuttiness, I'll just call it what it is. But uh, we're glad to be here, and uh, the fact that we moved out to Chapman was because Don and Tim were closer out there. Uh, we love the church here. We love the church at Tilpersville. We love the church at Chapman. Uh, we love the church at Beach Hill. And it's just been a pleasure to be associated with uh, the churches as I've moved back down here. <clears throat> when I decided to resign full-time work and uh, spend time in riding, especially in tracks and things that Gary, our other son, is putting on the web page for us for preachers to use. I didn't realize how much time I was going to be spending in doing this, but I'm enjoying it. I'm learning things that I wish I had learned years before. My daddy used to say, it's a pity you can't come into the world knowing what you know when you leave. You could do a lot better. And I think there's some truth in that. But our theme, our focus on Christ and our subject is the birth of Christ. This is the most important subject for all people. People who are not Christians and who don't understand Christ need to learn about him and learn about his birth. Those who are members of the church need to be reminded continually of Christ and who he is and why we do the things we do. The first thing I want to look at in this track is that the baby to be born existed prior to his birth. Now that's not true of any of us. We didn't exist prior to the time of our inception, but he did. 
He existed in eternity. In Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word God there is from the Hebrew word Elohim, and it means God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's a plural word, and it includes all three of them. Now, the one of the ways I know it includes all three of them is in John chapter 1, in verse 1 beginning, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses say he was just a God-like one. They need to go back and study. He was not a God-like one. He was deity or God. And uh, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So he had to exist prior to his inception and his birth to be there before creation and to be involved in creation. In Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now watch this. And by whom also he made or created the worlds. And so God was in the beginning in creation, but Jesus was the one that God used to create. In Genesis chapter 1, you go back, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. So God the Father was there, God the Son was there, and God the Holy Spirit was there. By the way, <clears throat> there are those who would tell us that the Holy Spirit was not deity. He was just an active force or a mighty wind. And of course the Bible says that he was deity. In Acts chapter 4, there was a great famine that came on the earth. And those people who were Christians back then had lands and houses, possessions. They sold those and brought the price of the things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to every man according to his need. Then you go right into chapter 5. And really, I wish they hadn't divided it there because there shouldn't be a division. The fourth chapter continues in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, a man and a woman, husband and wife, named Ananias and Sapphira, had possessions as well. Now, they also got money, and they brought a part of what was made and laid it down at the apostles' feet. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with what they did until they lied and said, we gave it all. Well, they didn't. And that was the problem that they had. But in that story, we learn that the Holy Spirit is deity as well as the Father and the Son because they were told, you have not lied unto man, but unto God. But they had lied to the Holy Spirit. And so in lying to the Holy Spirit, they were lying to God. And so there were the three personalities in the Godhead. Well, in Ephesians 3 verse 9, God created all things by Jesus Christ. And so you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all there active in bringing this into existence. Now that's why Jesus could say, before Abraham was, I am. He existed prior to Abraham. Now that's hard for us to understand. Because if I were to say about either one of you or myself, you existed before Abraham, that wouldn't be so. But it was true in the case of Christ. He existed prior to Abraham because Abraham was born after the world began and he existed prior to the beginning of the world. Well, there's other things there, but I can't spend all our time on that. Uh, Jesus had just simply talked even about how he existed with God uh, from the beginning in John chapter 17 in verse 5. But now I want to look at the second part of this. When we look at the second part of this, we find that uh, the Creator uh, was to be born. And the birth of Jesus Christ 
was mentioned from the beginning of time until he was actually born. Now in Genesis 3, 15, the Bible says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. This has reference to the birth of Jesus Christ. Now it doesn't say that right there, but that's the case nevertheless. Uh, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Well, that's a reference to Christ when Satan bruised his heel by having him nailed to the cross. And it's a reference to Christ who bruised the head of Satan when he came triumphantly out of the tomb on the first day of the week. The devil could put him there, but he couldn't keep him there. And every now and then in a funeral, if a person has been a faithful child of God, I'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and allude to it. And I will tell them, the devil can put you in the grave, but he can't keep you there. Jesus said, I marvel that, that you're uh, removed, Galatians chapter one. But he said in John chapter five in verse 28, that we would, those that were in the graves would come forward. Those that have done good unto the resurrection of life, those that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. But this is Christ being talked about in Genesis 3 and in verse 15. So he would come out of the grave and he would have to be born in order to be crucified and buried and be raised on the first day of the week. But I want to look at two statements in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah said, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, spelled with the E just here. But in chapter nine in verse six, uh, the same prophecy said, that a son would be born and a son would be given. Now I want you to look at that very carefully. A virgin will conceive. Is that a possibility? Not without God involved, it's not. No virgin will ever conceive. Now, we have what we call artificial insemination and you might have a woman having a baby who has not been with a man but that would be the only way it would happen today. And so it says that a virgin will conceive and she will bring forth a son. Now remember this was seven to 800 years before these events are going to take place. And yet Isaiah said a virgin will conceive and she will have a son and you'll call his name Emmanuel. And when you come to the New Testament, that's exactly what you find in Matthew 1, 16 to 25 and Luke 2, 6 to 20. By the way, let me tell you something that would blow the minds of the ACLU today. Many years ago when I was in the third grade, I had a teacher by the name of Miss Willine White. And at Christmas time, she got the idea that this was the birthday of Christ somehow. And anyway, she wanted us to memorize Luke chapter two, verses eight through 20. This was in public schools. Well, ACLU would have a tizzy over that today, wouldn't they? But we memorized that back in the third grade at Wilmire Elementary School, just north of Tryon, Georgia, in a little community. And we memorized it. They were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were so afraid. And, the angel, and that goes on. I don't even know if I can do all of it now, so I do the first two verses, and, and then I quit. I don't want to take a chance. But here was the birth of Christ announced. And what happened? Here is a woman who had not been with a man. In fact, when the angel appeared to Mary and told Mary, 
you're going to have a child. She said, how can this be? I've not known a man. How can this be? It's an impossibility. But you see, she hadn't factored God into it at this particular point. So she was a virgin in every sense of the word. Joseph knew he hadn't been a weather because he was about to put her away privately because he didn't want to make a public example out of her. That would have required her death, by the way, according to the law of Moses. And so Joseph just decided that he just put her away. But an angel appeared to him and said, Fear not to take unto thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. In other words, that baby is God's. She's not been with another man, Joseph. Don't worry about it. Don't think about that. She was overshadowed by the highest and the baby is going to be deity. That's why he would sometimes be called the son of God, the Holy Spirit being his father. And he would be called the son of man because he was born of Mary, a human. And so he was called both things. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But we have all of these events taking place. And in Luke chapter 1, 26 through 35, there's that great story of the angel appearing to Mary and telling her, ladies, can you think of this and think of what might have been going through her mind? I mean, imagine this. You're going to have God's child. This is the only way he could bring salvation uh, to be. And yet that's what he was going to do. And so the angel begins to tell Mary that you're going to have a baby. And she says, I can't. I've not been with a man. Well, it'll be from deity. Uh, it'll be God's child. And so Mary now uh, keeps all these things and ponders them in her heart. And that's in Luke chapter 2 uh, down around verse 20. In the third place, the birth of Jesus Christ took place. Now, he existed prior to the world. The prophets and others said he will be born and it will be a boy. By the way, uh, we have some doctors in our audience and we had a couple back home who was uh, expecting a baby. And they did a sonogram on this woman and they said, you're going to have a boy. Well, they told the church and the church said, we're going to have a shower. And so they went out and bought all kind of little old blue clothes. And guess what the baby was? Three guesses and the first two don't count. <laughs> it was a little girl. So all the women had to run back to the stores and trade the blue for pink and yellow or whatever they got. The doctor had a sonogram just a little while before the baby was born and he couldn't even be under, as Paul Murphy used to say, beyond a shade of a shadow of a flicker of a doubt, tell her what she was going to have. It was something else. And yet here are men who are writing hundreds of years before who are saying this will be a boy. And that's exactly what it was. Uh, Mary didn't have a daughter. She had, a, he, just here, she did later. But here she had a son just like the prophets had all predicted. Well, what uh, the prophets had said and what the angels had told her was exactly the way it uh, turned out to be. And I have some scriptures down here showing that Mary had a boy. Now, on that second column, I don't know, I have a laptop that is totally ignorant. I told it to put a period right there after Matthew 1, 22, that very last line. And look what it put. So just make a little mark through that and put a period there and you'll be right there. All right, Mary had a son, Matthew 1, 25 and Luke 2, 7 and so on. By the way, Hosea had even talked about that. You remember in Hosea 11, verse 1, Hosea said, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now that prophecy had two meanings to it. 
The first one had reference to the nation of Israel. You remember how they had been carried into um, uh, Egyptian captivity and they were there and then uh, they cried out to God and he delivered them. And so Hosea uh, refers to that event historically and talks about God calling Israel out of the land of Egypt. But it had a second application and that was to Christ. And that application had to do with after Jesus was born, old Herod the Great tried to kill him. He even tried to get the wise man to come back and tell him where he was. And they went another way because God told them to. But then God told Mo, uh, Joseph, take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Egypt because Herod wants to kill him. And you be there until I tell you to come back. And so after Herod died, God told Joseph to bring the child and his mother back. And so the prophecy in Hosea 11, 1 had to do with the Israelites uh, historically, but prophetically with Christ coming out of Egypt. And I know that because Matthew chapter 2 says that's the way it was. Well, uh, just after that, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea or Bethlehem of Judah. Now there were two Bethlehems in the nation of Israel, but the specific reference was this child, this boy, will be born in Bethlehem of Judea or Bethlehem Ephrath. It won't be born in this other Bethlehem. He had just said Bethlehem, and if he'd have been born in one of the two of them, everybody would have been carried away with that. But he specifically said Bethlehem of Judea, and that was the city of David, and that's exactly where he was born. Now, if you look at the spelling there on that third column, it has L-I-K-E. I don't think there is a writer named Like, so that must be Luke. So if you want to march through the eye there and put a David, I'll have a talk with my computer and we'll try to get stuff like that straightened out. By the way, Micah said exactly where he would be born. So we know where and when and why and how and all of the things that we need to know about the birth of Jesus. Now notice where he was placed, and I noticed somebody's put together a very beautiful little scene out here. Our Lord was placed in a trough, a feeding trough. There was no room in the inn, and so they told him you can stay out here in this little cave-like area where the animals stay, and we've got a feeding trough there. And so when Jesus was born, he was laid in the feeding trough of all things, the Son of God. Obviously, they didn't know what was going on here, but he was placed in that trough. And this was Mary's firstborn son. She, didn't, she knew not Joseph and he knew not his wife till she had brought first her, uh, forth her firstborn son. And so she had Christ before she had any other babies. And that way, nobody could ever say, well, she was with Joseph, and he may just not have known it. Uh, it may have been an accident. Uh, Sam and I had two children, and we decided that's all we need. And so we were not going to have another one. But along came Jones. And uh, so Donna was born, and we've been thankful. And when I hear people talk about having abortions, I think, what is wrong with you? We agonized over the fact that we almost lost her and the joy that she's been for these X number of years. You can ask her if you want to know how old she is. But uh, we've had just a thrill, and I can't imagine these people at the border murder these little babies. And yet that's exactly what a lot of people are doing today. Well, he was called Jesus according to Luke 1, 31, Matthew 1, verse 21. That's exactly how it was supposed to be. Now, Tim, am I supposed to quit anywhere for a break or just go to seven? Yes, whenever you want to. They're going to ring the bell here in a couple of minutes. But you break when you want to. Well, you, you tell me when you hear that bell. And I might or stand up because I probably will. Refreshments in the fellowship hall. 
Okay. Well, we'll uh, let everybody go get a bite. When, when you stand up and wave, because otherwise I'll do like I did at Nettleton this morning. I'll go over time. In Matthew chapter, uh, th Luke rather, chapter 3, verse 23, uh, the Bible says Joseph uh, Christ was as supposed, as supposed the son of Joseph. You still need to stand up. Uh, the word suppose comes from a word which means he was thought to be this. He was considered to be this. But he wasn't the son of Joseph. Now, I will tell you this. Joseph came through the proper seed line. Mary came through the proper seed line. If you look in Matthew chapter 1, uh, you have the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and so on. And it says, this one begat, this one went on down. And so of whom was born Mary, of whom was born the Christ. And so you have Mary coming through the seed line of David. And then you also have uh, Joseph coming through the seed line of David. And that's in Luke chapter 3 where you go back and, and you look at that and you see. So either way you cut it, uh, Jesus came through the proper seed line. But deity, God, was his father. Now, he was born during the days of Herod, Herod the Great. Now that's all the information we have about the time of his birth. I don't know what month he was born. I don't know what day he was born. And I don't know actually what year he was born. And there's been some confusion over the way we count time today about four years. So we may be four years ahead of time in the way we're doing things. But anyway, there are people who religiously every December the 25th conclude that this is the birthday of Christ. Well, they might know more than the Holy Spirit did or more than the Holy Spirit revealed because he never revealed the date or the time of his birth. He just never did. And yet people today make a big day out of December the 25th. I've heard it called the most important day of the year. Well, who called it that? God didn't. And so why are people making things out of things that the Bible made nothing out of? In the fourth place, the birth of Jesus was announced to the shepherds. Now you imagine this. Here are a bunch of shepherds out in the nation of Israel, likely on the side of a hill because it's a hilly place and it's a rocky place. I can understand why they stoned people because you didn't have to look anywhere to get a rock. Hardly. I mean, you look down, there's a rock. And so... Here the shepherds are out there and they're keeping watch over their flock by night and the angel of the Lord came upon them. Now that would be enough to excite somebody to see an angel. I was watching Ernest Ainsley years ago now and he was up there and he's always talking about how great he is but he does it in a humble way. And he said, there are angels all over this auditorium coming down. You can't see them, but I can. I'm the only one who can see them. And I thought if one angel appeared in that auditorium, he'd probably be hitting it. He'd be like the writer of the song when they brought out the rattlesnakes. You remember that? Where's the back door? They don't have one. We'll reckon where do they want one. Uh, hey, that's kind of the way Ernest would have been if he had seen something like that. But here an angel of the Lord appears to these shepherds. Now the Bible says they were sore afraid. Have you ever had anything to scare you so bad that it actually gave you a little bit of pain in your body? I have. I've had things to happen in my life and I'd just, you know, I'd shake and, and it'd be just I don't know what it's like. I can't describe it, but it was so afraid, I guess. But these angels were so afraid 
And the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy, for unto you shall be born this day in the city of David, or for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then they went on to sell. This would be a sign to them. They would find the babe wrapped in swaddling. And so they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe, uh, babe lying in a manger. And so here now is an announcement to the shepherds that this baby has been born and that he was born in order to save the people from their sins. Jesus wasn't just born to be born. He was born for a specific purpose, to save people from their sins. And it's sad that people today will not allow him to do that. Jesus, and in fact, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us. Now watch it. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everybody in the world to go to heaven but many people turn their backs on him. Atheists do, infidels, agnostics. Many religious people turn their backs on him. They're just not willing to submit to him. He's the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. But most people will not obey him. They have no desire to. Uh, I was talking to uh, someone uh, recently and was told this. Even if you could prove to me from the Bible that I am wrong, I would not change. Now that's a person who's without God and without hope in this present world. And that's a person who will never go to heaven. Now we need to be like Paul the Apostle. Paul thought he ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which also he said, I did. Many of the saints he shut up in prison. Others he punished them to strange cities, caused them to blaspheme. He told Agrippa this in Acts chapter 26. But when the Lord appeared to him, he didn't understand who it was to begin with. So he asked, who art thou? Lord? Now, there's several ways you can do that. Who art thou, Lord? Or who art thou, Lord? Or who art thou, Lord? So you, I don't know exactly which way, but this I know. Jesus appeared to him. Now, the people around him saw the light, but they didn't see Christ. But Paul did. They heard the sound, but they didn't hear the voice. Paul understood. And Jesus said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. The people who had oxen back then would have a long stick and a very sharp point on it. And if the oxen got a little bit lazy or one stopped meat grass, they'd punch him. Well, he couldn't stand that, and so he'd pick them feet up, and there he'd go with those hooves. He'd pick them up and go on down, and they might have to punch him again. Well, the Lord said, you're doing basically what that man does to an oxen. It's hard, though. You can't keep uh, backing up against that. It hurts too bad. And so he explained to him, you go into the city, and there it'd be told thee what thou must do. So he arose and he went into the city and Ananias came and told him, you still have your sins. Now the Bible doesn't say that in essence, but it says it in verse 16 of 22. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And when he was before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, Paul told Agrippa, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly calling. In other words, I got up and did it. Do you know you have people today, though, who believe Jesus was saved on the road to Damascus? 
when he saw the light, he was saved right then and right there. Let me tell you why that cannot be true. If it were true, God didn't know it because God said, you go into the city and there it will be told thee what thou must do. If he were saved on the road to Damascus, he didn't know anything about it because he got up and went into the city to find out what he was to do. If he were saved on the road to Damascus, Ananias the preacher didn't know it because when God told him to go speak to him, he said, hey, you know who that is? You know what he's done? God said, you go. Ananias went and he told him, your sins have not been washed away. Well, actually, here's why he said, why are you waiting? Why do you tarry? Get up, arise, and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. You can't wash something away. It's already been washed away. You've washed clothes for a number of years. Have you ever washed anything away that was already gone? Now you might wash it again, but you're not washing anything away if it's already been washed away. If he were saved on the road to Damascus, he's the only miserable saved man you ever read about in the Bible. But he was blind on the way to Damascus. Three days fasting and praying, that's a sign of repentance, not a sign of forgiveness. And if he were saved on the road to Damascus, he's the only saved man you ever read about that still had his sins three days later. But you don't have your sins after they've been forgiven. Your sins are forgiven, they're gone. And that's why we sing that song, Just As I Am. Uh, we talk about, but that thy blood was shed for me. And so when we sing that song, we're singing about God who forgave us our sins and put them all behind us. Let me just make this point and then we'll break. The birth of Christ is one of the greatest Christian evidences that there is. Now, what do I mean by Christian evidence? I mean something that is true beyond any doubt. From Genesis all the way through Revel uh, the book of Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first part of it, shows that Jesus would be born of a virgin, would have a son, he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. Now, if none of that happens, we're wasting our time here tonight. I don't know where I'd be, but I can tell you where I wouldn't be if I didn't believe that with 100% of my heart. And that's what Acts 8 says, if thou believest with all thine heart, not if you hope, you wish, uh, you'd like for it to be this way, but if you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, if none of that happened, then throw the Bible away and go fishing or whatever you like to do. But it did happen exactly without any change at all the way it was said in Genesis 3 in Isaiah and in other places. The Bible, as Brother Marshall Keeble used to say, the black evangelist, the Bible is right. It was right yesterday, it's right today, and it'll be right tomorrow. And yet I'm hearing people in fact, yesterday, was it yesterday or the day before we're on the news? They were talking about having this gathering where they could say, Every, God loves everybody, and He does. But God doesn't accept everything everybody does. And you can see a lot of examples of that in the Bible. But they were trying to say all of these little boys that want to be little girls, and all these little girls that want to be little boys, they were saying, because God loves everybody, we need to accept all of this. God loves everybody, but He hates every false way. And that's a false way if I've ever seen one. Imagine what the world would be like if everybody went that way. In less than a month, you probably wouldn't have a bird on the face of this earth. It takes them about a month to lay eggs and hatch them. If you just put two female birds together, you'd never have another egg hatched. It takes an eagle about a year to have two or three. 
And so in about uh, a year or so, well, no, they lived to be 30, 40 years old. In about 30, 40 years, you wouldn't have another eagle on the face of this earth. Just put a bunch of bulls in, uh, in a field by themselves and a bunch of cows in a field by themselves over here, you'll never have another calf. And so in that amount of time, this population, and if you took two human beings and put two males together and two females in less than 100 years or right at 100 years, you wouldn't have another thing on the face of this earth other than a tree or some grass or some things like that. If you just took the Bible out of the picture, you have to see that God didn't intend it to be that way. Well, we'll break here and then we'll take up point number five there and uh, see if we can get through that. What time do they need to be back in here? Uh, about, the bell 15, after. 15 after. Well, somewhere right about there. Another 30 minutes. That long enough. Yeah, that'll be plenty of time. All right. That's good because I can't work hard heavy machinery. Is that better? Yeah, I got it. Okay. I can't operate heavy machinery. Well, some of the others uh, come back in or maybe they decide to go on home. I don't know. But anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the birth of Christ. The main thing that I want to look at now is see what he was called in a number of different ways. Now, there's so many ways of looking at Jesus. Uh, one of the things he was called was Jesus, Matthew chapter 1, verse uh, 21 and verse 25. Uh, also in Matthew chapter 1, he is referred to as Emmanuel. Now, I mentioned this earlier. In the book of Isaiah, the spelling is E-M-M-A-N-U-E-L. In the book of Matthew, it is I-M-M-A-N-U-E-L. And because of that, some have said, ah, contradiction in the Bible. There it said e manual and here it says i manual And so therefore, it must be wrong. But let me run this by you. My mother-in-law's name was Johnny, Catherine Johnny Tyler. Now, I had a good friend by the name of Johnny. He spelled his name J-O-H-N-N-Y. She spelled hers J-O-H-N-N-I-E. Does that mean there was something wrong there because you have two spellings of that name? Uh, we had a boy at Freed Hardiman, and when he got to campus, he was on the campus in the girls' dormitory. That's where his room was. But uh, his name was spelled just like a female's name would have been spelled. And so they had to quickly rearrange that and get him a room in one of the boys' dormitories. Well, I mentioned being married to Sammy. I almost didn't get married to her because she was going home with a roommate for the weekend. And uh, I had seen her. Brother Hall had a class, and I was sitting in his class. And I looked out the window, and this little black-headed girl went walking by. And I thought, wow, i got to find her. But I looked and looked, and I couldn't see her anywhere on campus. So Betty Smith from Dalton, Georgia, wanted to ride home. I said, okay. Well, we were uh, getting ready to load up. And so there were two girls and myself and three boys. So sometimes I don't think very fast, but other times I do. 
And that was one of the occasions where I did. And so I said to the three boys, you're sitting in the back seat. And I said to Betty Smith, you're sitting by the window on the passenger side. I'm driving and I looked at Sammy and I said, you can sit anywhere you want to. And she got in and sat down right there beside me. Well, I knew that was a pretty good sign. So I said, what's your name? She said, Sammy. I said, I've got a brother named Sammy. And she didn't talk to me for the rest of the trip to Georgia. And I thought, boy, I blew that, didn't I? But uh, I thought about it over the weekend. And so we got it worked out. So I just kind of smothered her from that point on. And uh, we ended up getting married. Now, my brother's name was S-A-M-M-Y. Hers is S-A-M-M-I-E. So you have two, the same pronunciation with two different spellings. Nobody's ever said to me, there's something wrong here because your brother's, your wife's spell. Nobody does that. People understand. Sometimes people will go to the Old Testament and they'll find N-O-A-H, Noah. And then they'll come to the New Testament and sometimes it'll be, in the King James at least, N-O-E. And they'll say, look there, the Bible's got to be wrong because you have these different spellings. And you have a number of things like that. Now that tells me, one, that I'm on safe ground if that's the best they can do. And it, it's really the best they can do. But then you find a number of other things. Like I mentioned, Paul on the road to Damascus, he saw Christ. The people with him saw the light. He heard what Christ said. The people heard a voice. And we have that to happen all the time. Samuel and I be sitting in the house and uh, something will be on TV maybe. And I'll say, what did they say? Well, I heard it, but I didn't understand it. And so she will make some comment, such as they do make hearing aids or something to that effect. But we have one case in the Bible says they heard the voice and they saw the light, and the other one says they didn't. And so people think that's a contradiction, but it's not. They both saw something, but one saw a little more than the others did. They both heard something, but one heard a little bit more than the others did. So there's no contradiction there on this word Emmanuel, whether it's spelled with an E or an I. Either way you spell it, it means God with us. And that's exactly the way it was. God uh, was with them. Then he is called the son of the highest, Luke 1, verse 32. That's who would overshadow Mary. He is called the son of God, Matthew 2, 15, uh, Hosea chapter 1, three verses there. Uh, he's called the Alpha and the Omega, uh, which simply means the first and the last. And uh, he is the first uh, of his kind and the last. Uh, he is called the Christ. Uh, which is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. Uh, Matthew 2, 4, he is called the Word or the Word of Life uh, in various places. Uh, for example, uh, you have that in John 1, 1 to 3 and 1 John 1, 1 and chapter 5, verse 7. Sometimes he's simply referred to as the Lamb or as John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And each one of these words has a specific idea or meaning with it. Now, I've not talked about every one of those, but uh, we'll come down a little bit later and we'll see where he was called the Son of Man. That shows his deity as well as his humanity. When I first started preaching, I used to say Jesus was half man and half God. He was the Son of God and the Son of Man. He wasn't half of anything. He was total deity. He was totally of Mary, a human being. And so that's the significance of that. And then he is called the shepherd. In John chapter 10, he is called the good shepherd. 
And a good shepherd will even give his life for his sheep. He watches over them. And he makes sure that nothing is coming in to affect them or to get them. He is called the chief shepherd because elders in the flock are shepherds. But Jesus is the chief shepherd uh, from whom they get their uh, things to encourage us to do. Uh, he is called the Lord. And the word Lord carried, is sometimes translated sir or master. And so that will give you the idea there. He is the Messiah. Uh, there's been a lot of things said about that and even musical written on it. But he was called the Messiah in John 1, 41. We have found the Messiah. And uh, that's who Jesus, they were talking about Jesus. And then he was called a Nazarene in Luke chapter 2. When he came back from Egypt, uh, he eventually was carried to the city of Nazareth uh, that it might be fulfilled, saying he would be called a Nazarene. That's the last verse of Matthew chapter 2. And then under the Old Testament in uh, Isaiah 9 and verse 6, he was called Counselor, Mighty, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and uh, the Mighty God. So he's called all of those different things. In Romans chapter 11, verse 26, he's called the Deliverer or the Redeemer. And in chapter 3, verse 4, in Ephesians 1, verse 7, and also back in Isaiah 59, 20. In John 14, Jesus proclaimed himself to be the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. There's no other truth. You know, you can't say, well, two plus two equals four, and two plus three equals four. There's only one truth about that. Two plus two equals four. And anything contrary to that's not so. And the same thing is true with the Word of God. Jesus is the way, He's the truth, and He is the life. And then the other things go on, but I didn't have room to lust them. Now, look at some of the things related to His birth. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, the Bible says Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God and man. So Jesus grew in the only four ways an individual can grow. He grew uh, morally, physically, he grew spiritually, and so on now. He, he just grew every way you can. Uh, he grew with man as well as with God. And uh, this is one of the things that is most interesting to me. In Acts 3.22, he is referred to as a prophet. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 17, he is referred to as the priest or the high priest. And in the book of Revelation, as well as Acts, he is referred to as the king. So he is prophet and priest and king. And we sometimes sing a song that has those three in there. Now, when Jesus came to the point where he would be prophet and priest and king, he would have the right to sit on the throne of his father, David. Well, this would have been one of his of relatives back through the line. We look at Jesus today as the Savior. And when I lived in Coleman, Alabama, I had a daily radio program. And sometimes the ministerial, well, the ministerial association had a program on right before mine. And so many times I'd come on and correct what they said. And uh, the man at the radio station came down and he said, I just don't know how you can think that fast and do that. I said, I'm not thinking that fast. This book was written a long time ago, and I've been reading it and studying it for years, and all I'm doing is referring to what's already there. But many times they would talk about Jesus and God and their love and their saving grace, and that's about all they would talk about on their program. And so I've told them that in the book of James, in chapter 4, verse 12, 
The Bible says there is one lawgiver, now watch it, who is able to save and to destroy. In the same verse, the inspired writer of the book of James said that God is a God of love, but he will not tolerate everything. He will save those who do right and he will destroy those who do wrong. Well, many people miss that. But one day he'll be our judge. We're going to stand before God one day to receive the things done in our body according to what we've done, whether it be good or bad. If we've lived soberly, righteously, and godly, we'll hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We'll hear him say, come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But if we've been ungodly and had worldly lusts as a part of our life, this is all in Titus 2, 11 and 12. We'll hear him say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and for his angels. Now don't let somebody convince you that hell is not real. If hell is not real, how could heaven be? Because in Matthew 25, 46, he talked about those who are unrighteous will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous in the life eternal. So if one of those is not so, how do we know the other one is so? How do you make that decision? And how do you make that difference? I don't know how you would. One of the things that I think is so very important, in fact, it may be the most important, is the fact that Jesus willingly, gladly, sacrificially allowed them to nail him to a cross and to take the blood from his body, which created death. Jesus said, I lay down my life for my sheep. I lay it down, I take it up. No man can take it from me. And uh, you find that reference in the book of Matthew and in First Peter and other places. But uh, Jesus uh, laid his life down. When they beat him, he allowed them to do it. You remember when Peter, when they were arrested him in the garden, Peter drew that sword off, out, cut off the right ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, like he was going to stop the band of soldiers. Jesus told him, put that up. I could call the angels and stop this. But he was dying for the sins of the world. He could have kept those men from beating him with those whips with bones and rocks and things in them. He could have stopped all of that. But he came to do his Father's will. And on the cross, he could say, I've done that, I finished it. It's finished. I've done what God sent me to do. It's now up to us to do what God wants us to do. He's done his part. I have a sermon that I preached that I got from somebody years ago. It was talked about the chain of salvation. And it had God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Word and such like. And then it had the chain going down here. And here was God up at the top. And here was man at the bottom. And here was man trying to come up through hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized and being faithful. And when man got up and had done his part, God had done his part already. And so that would bring about salvation. I don't remember who put that together, but it was a very fine lesson. And I didn't apologize for borrowing it. I'm like Tom Holland. When I buy a book, it's mine. I can do what I want to with it. It's my sermon now. And so I'll use it if I want to. Well, he did what God wanted him to do. God sent him into the world to save the world from sin, John 3, verse 16. And so the precious blood of Christ was shed. You know, one of the things that aggravates me, in fact, I had an English teacher who used to say it, it irks a hanner out of me. And I guess that makes it English all right. But we have brethren today who are wanting us to take the word blood out of our songs. 
because it's offensive to them. Well, let me tell you something. The word blood is not offensive to me. You take the blood out of your body, you won't have to get it all out and you'll realize that something's about to happen to you. You're going to die. The blood, the life is in the blood. And we need to understand that the word blood should not be offensive to us. If Christ had not shed his blood, we couldn't possibly go to heaven. The Hebrew writer in chapter 10, verse 4, and chapter 9, verse 27, told, tells us that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. It took the precious blood of Christ. So don't ever let anybody tell you that we ought to quit singing songs with the word blood in it or that we ought to take that out of the songs and put another word in it. Uh, there's no other word that'll get it like the word blood does. He came to save us from our sin. Now, he willingly, lovingly laid down his life. See that John 110 verses 15 to 18? Are there 110 chapters in the book of John? Well, it must be John 10. So just mark one of those ones off there. Probably the first one will make it look better. And uh, it's John 10, 15 to 18, where he laid his life down. And uh, he was declared to be the Son of God when he came out of the tomb. Now, had Jesus not come out of the tomb, he would have been no better than you or me and anyone else. But when he came out of that tomb, Romans 1 verse 4 says he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. He declared himself to be. The devil could put him there, but he couldn't keep him there. And as Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But it's almost like me, Paul is shaking his fist in the hands of death and saying, you think you won? You've not won anything. Where's your sting? Where's your victory? Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory and that victory is our coming out of the beds of clay. John 5, 28 and 29. And so we get the victory. We get the last laugh. Well, the amount, the, uh, now here's the biggie. The announcement of the birth of Jesus caused John to leap in Mary's womb. Now that would be a real story. Donald's going to have to come fix that ignorant computer because it was not in Mary's womb. Whose womb was John in? Elizabeth. And so, I don't know how that Mary got there, but I know that's not what I hit on the keyboard. But anyway, that's uh, just mark through Mary and put Elizabeth there and you'll have it the way it is. And that's in Luke chapter 1, verse 41 and 44. Well, everybody who understands that ought to become a Christian. Anyone who does not understand that needs to study until they get, they get, they get the virgin birth of Christ. And what a great subject this has been for Vacation Bible School. So talk to people about that and show them what they need to do for this birth to mean anything to them. And people who are not, or who are Christians, but who are not living the Christian life, show them what this means and bring them to repentance. And then all others uh, just remind constantly. And there's nothing wrong with reminders. Peter wrote to some people and in 2 Peter chapter 1, he told those people, I'm putting you in remembrance I haven't told you anything in here tonight that you didn't already know. If you've studied the Bible a year, you know everything I've said tonight. So I've not impressed you at all along that line. All I've done is remind you, as Peter said he did those people, though you be established in the present truth. And so remind one another constantly. 
in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the gathered manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So talk to one another about these things. Remind one another of who we are, what we are, and the hope that we have. Uh, people should not be offended at that. But was I supposed to quit about 15 till? Yeah, a couple of more minutes. Anyone have any comments that you want to make in connection with this? We had one here. James told me a while ago, he said on the uh, matter of Saul of Tarsus, uh, go ahead and tell the people what you, on the matter of Saul of Tarsus, where he saw the light, he obeyed uh, the gospel that was preached to them. And uh, what, you made a point on that. You didn't. You heard it. I'm trying to think exactly the way he stated that. But it was, uh, it had to do with Saul's salvation and that if he had to do certain things, and we know he did because it's what's said, then we should get the other things that he did as well. But... Uh, I'm talking about Christmas. Yeah, People the, that make a big I, deal out of Christmas. By, that's right. And hey. it's not indicated in the Bible. But the Bible does tell us to remember his death and very few do it. The Bible says that he came out of the tomb on the first day of the week and we're to observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week and we give on the first day of the week. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, if we get that, then why, if God wanted us to celebrate the birth of Christ, why didn't he give us all of the information that he did about his death, burial and resurrection? That is a tremendous point for us to keep in mind. And I'm going to write it down because I'd already kind of forgotten it. Sometimes I leave the house and slam my wife and kiss the door. I, it's done got that bad. But not really. I told the lady that one day and she said, well, you need to call the iron and apologize. I said, don't get something started. I'm just joking. Any, any other comments? That was a good one. We would have had it there, wouldn't we? And uh, we're not to add to, we're not to take away from. That was in Deuteronomy 4, 2, in Proverbs 36, and in Revelation 22, 18 and 19. So in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end of the Bible, we're told, just do it like it is, don't change it. Great point. Great point. That's why it's good for classes to speak up. People like me teaching, just do like that. Make a comment. 